Hello, it's Chuck from Above the Basement, Boston Music and Conversation. The local evening news was always a big part of my day. At 6 p.m., we'd sit down to watch TV and get our fill of what's happening in our city and the world. A lot has changed since those days, but the names and faces of the anchors who spoke to us every day are as familiar as they have ever been. There was recently a reunion of sorts with the Boston WBZ team of Jack Williams, Liz Walker, Bob Lobel, Bruce Schwegler, and of course, arts and entertainment reporter Joyce Kulhaywick. And it was as if no time had passed since we last saw them. We ran into Joyce at a Yo-Yo Ma Silk Road performance in Cambridge last year and immediately decided that she needed to come on the show. Joyce continues to be an advocate for the arts in Boston and also offers her insight and theater and movie reviews through her Joyce's Choices blog. She is a motivational speaker and as a three-time cancer survivor, she's become a tireless crusader against cancer and has raised millions in the support of American Cancer Society's Hope Lodge in Boston that provides cancer patients and their caregivers a free place to stay when their best hope for effective treatment may be in another city. So here is our conversation with Joyce Cole Haywick, recorded at Woods Hill Table in Concord, Massachusetts. It was that night that I booked Yo-Yo for my living room, which we have to talk about. <laughs> well, that's a great way to start. For your living yeah. room. Oh yeah, my living room, believe it or not. That's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. Actually, we should have probably done this podcast in my living room. I would have been uh, totally up to being in your living room. You said you're in Wayland? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, it's done. Yeah. We should have. Well, we should have. I didn't didn't even think of that. You were saying Woods Hole Table, and I thought, oh, that's so convenient because I'm right out here. Well, that was actually the first time time I met you. Right. Other than on my TV set as a kid was uh, was at Yoga. You grew up watching me. I did. I did. (laughs) I did, and it's so funny because I'll talk to people. I'm like, "Oh yeah, so I'm interviewing Joyce Kilherrick," and they're astounded, like, "Joyce Kilherrick, I can't, you really? Oh my god!" I'm either awesome. legendary or a non-entity. It's one <laughs> or the other, you know. And you know, we just saw Liz Walker. We didn't meet her, but we saw her talk. But <laughs> look at the professional. That was amazing. I know. Yeah, Have I mean, you done I know that my before? Best angle. I know what that I was. Awesome. Wait, that was a Joyce. That was a Joyce's choices moment right there. <laughs> it really the was. Right, the right yeah. palm. And yeah. my right side is my best side, so please get over there. <laughs> I beg to differ, Joyce. I'm on your left. Yeah, well, my 65-year-old left side, I tell you, it doesn't get easier. <laughs> That's a good name for the book. It doesn't my get si- easier? My or? 65-year-old left side. Yeah. <laughs> Joyce, I met you with yes. Rudy Tanzi and oh, Lisa my God. Wong yeah, yeah, of course, at, at Mass that panel. General, right, at the panel where they had the, uh, they that actually had. That was extraordinary. It was really. The arts music therapy thing. I still great. use those videos and talks that I give. It was completely, I was completely blown away. I mean, Rudy Tanzi's a genius and what they're doing is really yeah. extraordinary. And I still remember things that he said yeah. about the yeah. two hemispheres of the brain and the corpus callosum being thicker in musicians because both halves are stimulated. I mean, I talk about this as another way in yeah. which the arts are crucial and in a way that we can quantify because it's very hard to quantify that it's hard to convince people why the arts are important i mean you either get that or you don't i like the way you use the word convince because Mm. you said something recently about arts for art's sake Mm -hmm. which you have to take into consideration oh yeah as you know i'm in medicine and i work with rudy and others people are starting to show scientifically that dance and music and visual arts stimulate the brain and are good for the kids for math, the kids for right. all aspects of educa- right. education. But at the end of the day, I think it's always good to just step back and say, wait a second, you don't have to describe why this works. Mm-hmm. This is just working for you, and this is the well, arts. These are the arts. I beg to differ, though. I think, unfortunately, you have to describe why. You have to convince people, and you have to construct an argument where you can actually measure and quantify for funding. how. Yeah, absolutely for funding because right. people. Oh, I agree. Yeah, okay. I thought you were saying sort of the opposite, no, which is like, it's you know, there is art for art's sake, but no, you know, these days you really, it's important to say why and how things are important, and people who are artists know because that's the lens through which they view the world, and it's a language that they speak, and I, I'm on that wavelength, but for most people. It sounds like a frill, like a luxury, like a little extravagance. And yeah, it would be nice if the kids could have some music. But right. what they really need is to go out and get a job. So how, so how does do you one make that? the case in, right. a, in a climate where funds are so hard to come by, and yeah. where everybody's got their hand out, that this is a crucial thing in a person's development? And so science is helping because we can now 
give you the measurements. We can show you how to quantify the actual impact, the effect of the arts on a human being and how that might affect them in the workplace, for example. Whether they're doing playing the violin or whether they're uh, writing a computer program for somebody or whether they're in medicine or if they've had a stroke and need, how to, need to know how to walk again. Yeah. So when do you think that started right. happening? Because I remember it was when they started in schools starting to wipe out their music oh, program. It's always and, been true. But the arts have always been last on the totem pole. But didn't it seem to get worse in like the 80s in the schools and like it, they, all suppose. these programs that were here, they yeah. all of a sudden started disappearing. You started seeing all those ads on television, musicians speaking up for arts in schools and stuff like that. And maybe yeah, it's just maybe like, there was a consciousness about it, a, a recognition of something that had always been so. Mm. But it seemed to me that this has always been so. Mm. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, it is hard to quantify. Number two, it's traditionally the province of women. Women are artsy or they it's a softer, more feminine kind of way to go at the world where science and technology are male masculine. and yeah. masculine and math. And so we have STEM. Which is should be STEAM. Absolutely. Right. Yo-Yo and I agree on this. It should absolutely be STEAM, but we've had to make the case for that. Sounds better too. Yeah, it does. It sure does. Yeah, it's energy, right? I mean, it's energy. <laughs> you moderated something back in 2015 when there were candidates for governor, and then a current governor didn't wasn't able to make it. Then. <laughs> Charlie. But uh, we won't. Charlie, who says to what I wrote to him once. Yeah. He wrote to me about the clash. This is so the funny. Clash. It's yeah, absolutely about the clash. He was a viewer. He was at home. I remember the first time I officially met him, he said, do you know? I wrote you a letter. I said, did I write back? He said, yes. Ah. I said, thank God. <laughs> yeah, what, he's now the governor. Thank God I didn't just was blow he like him a, off. Was he like a college guy he at the time? He was like a college kid, yeah. and he wrote to me because he didn't like the report I'd done on the clash. I didn't spend enough time. And I, oh. The clash and I said, in the band, the clash. I'm impressed. Yeah, yeah, the clash. Yeah. He, was, right, he so, got mad because you... Yeah, yeah. And he was, you know, and so he wrote me a letter. Wow. And I wrote back. And I said, well, look, I didn't have a lot of time. And, you know, it's always very truncated. And don't confuse my limitations yeah, with yeah. those of the medium and sure. you know whatever and, and I love the clash and I'm so impressed it's it really kind of cool yeah but that was our first uh, connection but he didn't show up for this forum yeah. that uh, we moderated I think on, they were all uh, Democrats on the board they the were um, there were maybe there were some no, Martha Coakley they, was they, there Martha and, was there and a few other people yeah. there was a, a huge forum yeah. I mean Marty was there yeah there even was, though he, yeah right. it was the do you think he held a grudge about that all those years? No, I think he loved that I wrote back to him. Yeah, I would too. <laughs> and that was pre-email too. It's it probably an actual oh, letter. I wrote him. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. great. Yeah. I wrote him. I mean, I you know I used to answer everybody. I yeah. believe in that. You know. Yeah, me too. I have a sort of a Victorian sense of. I still believe in that. It's it's, it's called, coming back. You know, I think. it's all it's it's being polite. Yeah, politeness you gotta, is missing. I mean, sure, everything like that's coming back because we all want that human touch now. All of a sudden, everything comes it's back. Plus ça change, plus c'est shows, right? I mean, that's right. how it is. But the reason I brought that up is I'm wondering if you can see, I mean, they all kind of agreed, yeah. yes, arts are important and they should all be. Well, yeah. But, I mean, yes. But, but do, you, do you see an improvement in Boston as far as support for the arts at all? I mean, that's a heavy question. No, do I you, don't see an improvement. Yeah. I see maintaining see the status quo. Yeah. Okay. I see us go through these machinations every single time the budget comes up and yeah. they say they're going to slash the arts budget and then the arts people rally themselves and thank God Matt Wilson over at Mass Creative is doing an extraordinary job of organizing people in a grassroots way. He knows how to do that. Yeah. They fight, 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 and then we get back level funding, and we consider it a triumph. Right. And you know what the funding is? Lose it. It's seventeen million dollars. This is like take it out of paper clips. Right. That's. <laughs> yeah. do, do they use those anymore? Yeah. I mean, you know, this is like chump change. Yeah. So mm. it's not getting better. We are so culture rich in this town. We have more arts organizations per square inch than I believe New York City has. Really? And that was quantified by Arts Boston uh. in a document called The Arts Factor where mm. they analyzed a lot of things, the kind of money that the arts bring in, how many arts organizations there are, some of the Im- the economic impact of this. It's still, it's a long road. Mm. There's a lot of people in line ahead of the arts. You know, and the MBTA and the roads, and you know, are all falling apart. And you know, I mean, it's yeah. Do you fix a bridge, or do you <laughs> let this play go on? What do you choose? But right? what's extraordinary is that the arts keep going. 
I mean, that there are so many theater companies. There's a thirst for it. You cannot make a dime in the theater. Every single one of these actors doesn't have two sticks to rub together. They are all working other jobs. Some of them are probably working here at Woods Hill Table. Well, you can talk about... They're bartenders, they're waiters. They're musicians, too. They're music... Absolutely. Club Pasim is a non-for-profit organization. Yeah. You know, they, they do education, too, so they do a lot of other things, but... It doesn't seem unusual that a restaurant slash performance space is a non for profit. I think it's great because they're doing they're doing great right now. So you're saying it should be for profit? Well, I mean, I mean, well, I yes. wish it was. Yeah, why, right. Why not? Yeah. Well, the arts also have sort of low self esteem. I know. I think that that's really <laughs> it's so true. sad. <laughs> well, I think <laughs> it's great to have you here on many for many reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm actually not from here, born and raised in Boston. However, I've been in New England for years and years. From New York area, upstate New York. That's okay. So, and I'm sorry about that. But we did bring Wegmans, so that's that's. I grew up outside of New York City in uh, Connecticut. You're in Connecticut, right? Oh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. I was born in Stamford. Oh, you're kidding! But I was only there for like. Oh, so that was the lovely end. You were born in Stamford, Connecticut. Oh, I was born in Stamford, but we moved. I was born at the ass end of Connecticut. I've heard that. Yeah, Bridgeport, Connecticut. We draw a diagram. What were you? Where were you born? More like the mouth. If you look at the if if you look at the map of it, it actually looks County, a very wealthy county yeah. but bridgeport is not one of those places it's he was tough. like the forehead <laughs> exactly yeah. tough working class town all my family working class <laughs> lower middle class worked in the factories worked at my mother worked at sikorsky aircraft my grandfather worked oh. at remington i mean you know i drive but, by sikorsky all the time oh my gosh my mother worked there for 35 years she can name mm. every helicopter it's a and, cool you know, it's a cool little uh, place to drive by you see all these big huge helicopters oh yeah and she worked at the bridgeport plant and then in the stratford plant the only city i knew growing up was new york city so i thought every city was new york city right. and then i thought well i go to school in boston there are a lot of schools in boston and I we drive into Copley Square, and I said, "Oh, this is really cute. Where's the city?" And they said, "You're Isn't in it." it. And yeah. I thought, "Wow, this is amazing." You came to Simmons, and you were you were hooked, and you stayed. Oh, I loved this city right. instantly, instantly. It's Everything small, about small, in a sense. It's small and it's large. There was a singer songwriter that used to have a restaurant in Boston named Mary Gaucher. And she came back to play at City Winery Boston a few months ago. And she said something to us that I won't forget. And she said, it's the most liberal, segregated city I've ever known. Absolutely correct. And I wanted to get your perspective, too, from when we talk about arts and we mm-hmm. talk about how it brings us together. Mm-hmm. It's a big question, but I'm sort of, it intrigues me, your experience through arts and entertainment over the years, if that's something you've thought about, the connection that we all have together in that space of the arts. We probably haven't utilized the arts as well as we might to bring people together. I mean, what Mary Gaucher says is absolutely true. It's still a very neighborhoody place. There are still very segregated parts of Boston. It's very tribal. It's, you know, very small town in many ways. But it also has an incredible transient population, the huge influx of students and professionals and executives and a global kind of impact as well. So it's both large and small, but it's hard in Boston to cross these lines. It takes a long time in this city to do that. I mean, I still feel not like a newcomer exactly, but I am not a Bostonian in that I I wasn't born here. Unless you're born here, you can't really call yourself a Bostonian in that way. It took me yeah. about 10 years, I would say, to be accepted. And then once you're in, you're in. Yeah. I think there's a lot of competition with arts groups. We try to come together, but there's such a small pot of money available. Yeah. We're all after the same audiences. There isn't even enough audience, I don't think, to support all of what goes on here. And it isn't that you want to be so competitive, but that's just by default what occurs. But I think all the artists working here understand that we have a lot more in common than what separates us, that we're all trying to reach for, you know, this common humanity, that this is what the arts absolutely access, the truth, especially now, you know, in this era of fake news and alternative facts. And, you know, the artists, artists try to get at what's the real deal, what's really going on. You know, that's Shakespeare holding a mirror up to life. and Yeah. The culture uh, ref- is reflected back to us through the arts. And we see who we are. We have conversations about who we are. But 
you got to get all the people in the seats. You know, it's predominantly white audiences that are place. at the theater. It's still very difficult to make these connections. But artists have as good a chance as anyone at making those connections. Yeah, I think you're right. I've been looking at Joyce's Choices, mm-hmm. and it's funny because we've talked to the waitress people, and then we talked with On Your Feet recently. And you had your, your great article on On Your Feet that I felt really speaks to that when the Cuban-American experience was told by Gloria and bringing people to the theater that normally weren't in the theater Mm -hmm. or aren't in the theater Mm -hmm. and how that parallels with Hamilton and how it's better but yet like you said it's still a price yeah because you know a theater ticket is still expensive it's still hard to but not every theater ticket is expensive there's a lot of smaller theater companies that do great work and they're it's often a pay what you can or it's a matinee or you know whatever but it's it's very difficult yeah. Even for people to find out what's going on and then to make a decision about, oh, was that worth seeing? And then, you know, and then all the rest of it, the parking and getting into town or, you know, all of that. And it's a complicated. It's part of the cultural experience. It's, yeah, it's <laughs> well, what, a complicated I thing. wonder if you think, I was, I was just thinking the other day, the only time you have a show come in here and stay for an extended period of time. I know like Book of Mormon stayed for a little while. I know that uh, Sheer Madness has been here. For, it's the longest running in the United yes. States or something like that. <laughs> and it's a very funny it's, show I'd, still. I've seen it. It's fantastic. Yeah. And, and, uh, and certainly Blue Man Group. And, but what we, you know, the Broadway in Boston, those are our traveling troops. Those are and, big shows of usually revivals. Right. Yeah, because and, they're guaranteed to put people in seats. People know them. Do you think that's part of the fabric of what you were just talking about, that we're not getting long extended run shows as much as maybe uh, New York does, it could. Be, I mean, it could be certainly the number of theaters we have here, the number of bigger theaters we have here. Mm-hmm. But w- I was wondering, I was wondering why they're not staying longer than just a week. They're moving on too quickly. It's just or- a certain. It's a business model. You know, you got to keep these shows on the road to make money. Maybe that's all they think they can. They blanket the area with a certain number of tickets they feel they can sell. I don't know what the thinking is around. Why uh, they stay or- I mean, it's a good thing that they do, and uh, there's more shows that come in. But we have regular local theater that's here all the time, and I'm trying to think of something I would recommend right now. Oh, my gosh, there's a gorgeous production of Actor Shakespeare Project doing Much Ado About Nothing at the Cambridge Multicultural Arts Center. It's killer. Really? This is such a good show, and it's there for another week. And I don't know how much that ticket is, but maybe $20, something like that. That's very affordable. affordable. It's almost what you're going to pay at the movies now, and forgive me, ASP, if I'm wrong about that price, but it's a terrific show. Not with a large popcorn, though. Like no, not with but they they sell candy and it's in a great yeah. space and it's a where really is it in, where in Cambridge? It's a Cambridge on um, either Third Street or Second Street, the Cambridge Multicultural Arts Center, yeah. and it's a fresh take on Shakespeare. Claudio is played by a woman, so there's this gender bending thing, and they've got a tune by I think Beyonce in the thing, oh, and really? then it's a and the direction is really interesting, and it's yeah. it's just really funny and really lively, and it's light and dark, and it's well active so that's just one and there are many shows and then there's the ART but you know I think that what you're mentioning Chuck is that Broadway in New York is this cultural you know icon or legendary group for what 100 years or more you're talking about shows that play in in Broadway well in New York City and so Boston I don't think really we get those shows well we get the shows coming through but well we used to be a pre-Broadway tryout town yeah. Shows used to come here first, and our critics oh. and our audiences would have at them. And then they would tweak these shows, and really? then they would go to Broadway. Really? Yes, and it's extraordinary that you don't know that. But it says yeah. a lot to me, because that's how long ago it was right. that huh. we were known as a pre-Broadway town. Yeah. And now we've got the Colonial Theater, which is just reopening. This Ambassador Theater group has come in, and they're, I think, based in London, And they are bringing in Moulin Rouge as their first show. And maybe it's going to be more of a pre-Broadway kind of tryout town again. But again, that whole model for 
what tries uh. out where and how th- shows get tweaked and what new work even happens. It's very expensive to mount a new show and take a chance on it. Everything yeah. is very costly. So well, you know, also is, that the whole theater district now is really kind of revamping. They're really oh, it's it's, it's completely different. Yeah. it used to be you know the the red light district. Yeah, exactly the red light district. Now yeah. it's a theater district. Yeah. And that's so been that, true for a long time. So that can obviously have a hard effect on the theaters that live in that area. Well, think about Forty Second Street. I mean, it's not well, exactly that's true. It hasn't back, been exactly the uh, I lived in New York. Beverly Hills. I lived in New York when yeah. that right. when that Forty Second Street wasn't a place you wanted to walk around. But right, exactly. That, well, Times back. Square wasn't yeah. a place you no. wanted to walk around before Rudy Giuliani got in there. And you I'm know, not sure I still want to walk around. You know. There, but, <laughs> But, but you can walk around. Well, now it's all can. very corporate and commercial yeah. and, you know, whatever. But but it feels a little safer. But it is level. nice to, to walk around that area and you can see it, this, it's just Oh, you've got the cleaner. Wang Center. The, now the Bach Center Bach, with yeah, the Wang the Theater. You've got the Schubert Theater right across the street, which is right. beautiful. You've got the Wilbur. That's now more of a supper club and it's for comedians. You've got uh, the Arts Emerson. Emerson, uh, they're Paramount. doing a whole new building now. You've got the Cutler Majestic, which is a gorgeous theater right on uh, Boylston Street or Tremont Street. We have some of the most beautiful theaters in the yeah. world. And now that also downtown crossing, they're re- re- do- redoing that area. It's all right there connected to oh, each yeah. other. So it's fantastic. You've got, the, you've got the Godfrey Hotel and you've got a whole bar scene that's come up. The city's it's coming alive, yeah. but there's some things about it that are still distinctly Boston, which I kind of love and hate. Right. I right. kind of love that you can't find your way around Boston. I kind of love the streets are crazy. Yeah, I'm a very aggressive driver. So. Well, yeah. then you fit right in. What's the problem? I do, exactly. So you I are think a it's, Bostonian, I, Joyce. I really am. I think I really am. You know, I kind of love that you have to know certain things about the place or you can't figure it out. Well, it's Darwinian, <laughs> you know. Let you're me, gonna, you're the city dares you to not. kind of like survive here, which right. I kind of like. It makes you tough. If I'm in like the financial district, I'm totally lost. We were trying to find this place the other day, and I was I had no idea which direction to go. Yeah, and guess no, what? The financial no district is a spit away from the uh, downtown right crossing. It's right there, which is right near the Back Bay. Yeah. which right. is right. I mean, you know, you which is right to the south. <laughs> it's like, yeah. but if you gave me, say, I'll give you a hundred dollars hey, if you well, can find out where it Roxbury. is. Let's talk about Roxbury. Let's talk about. Do you know where Florian Hall is? Do you know where Hibernian Hall is? Do you know where those places are? Do you know where the Strand Theater is? I mean, you know, <laughs> that's the part of town that needs to really wake up. A lot of that has to do with the way in which economically those parts of town have been discriminated against. Mm -hmm. The Globe just did that extraordinary Mm -hmm. spotlight report on the net worth of an African American in Boston. Mm Mm-hmm. Eight dollars. Mm. The closest city to that would be Philadelphia with seventeen dollars. That's just a crime. You know yep. how many liquor licenses get handed out in that part of town? Not as many as should be. So the Strand Theater, when they were mounting productions there a couple years ago, you wanted to pop out and get a drink or a cup of coffee at a cafe. It didn't exist. Mm. I popped out to get a cup of coffee during intermission, and I couldn't, couldn't find, find a place. A place Anywhere. This is all deeply tied in with the economic fabric of the city, the politics of the city. Ayanna Presley is working on this right now. Mm-hmm. But, but what that's think- the part of town that needs to come alive. And there are artists there and they are trying hard to connect. What would help with that connection? Well, building up these parts of town. Liquor licenses in some places so people can establish business in this area. People don't really get out of the house much anymore. Yeah. Even in the places that have Someone needs theater. to be focused. And I actually asked Diana Presley this question. I said, what do we do? She said, you know, talk to people, invite people. You're having a dinner party, you're giving a block party, you invite people from across the way. Yeah. <laughs> invite people you wouldn't normally connect with socially. Have you been to Wally's Cafe on Mass Ave? It's a jazz oh, place in yeah. a brownstone. So it's a it's a bar. And, well, and I don't, our live music, obviously. So, right, at the end of the brownstone is the best jazz you'll hear in the city. What's fascinating is that it is half white, half black. Yeah. And it's one of the only places I've ever seen so in Boston. So this is an anomaly. Where they, there's a cross, and what is it? It's yeah. music. That's a unique place. It's been around for a long time. So everyone knows this. We yeah. know music is the universal language. We know that. But how do we create a place where people can come together? So Wally's Cafe has figured this out. And why is there only maybe one Wally's Cafe? And it's small and it's jazz. And can you do it with classical and rock? Absolutely. And a- is it something about jazz? Probably. Oh, well, I don't jazz, know. I mean, you know, it's really tough to find venues to, I mean, jazz, they cut Eric Jackson on the radio. I mean, they just don't feel like there's a big 
appetite for jazz, but there may be. I mean, it's all what's perceived as commercial. And hip hop has more of a foot in Boston. Absolutely. And it didn't. We've talked well, to some hip hop artists. Hip hop is totally, and rap have totally changed the landscape. It is now what is happening. So we need to find places where that can happen that's more exactly frequently right. with people of every color. But that's and how p- do we bring them together? That, but that's what we found talking to some of the rap and hip hop artists. Yeah. Is they're shut out from using the venues. They won't. They can't get the venue. Yeah. And not only that, there's now a big problem of, p- of rehearsal space for bands. Yeah. They, well, the city is actually trying to figure that out. There's some just Julie recently. Julie Burroughs is, is, is yeah. trying to figure out, but mostly she's focused on theater, I believe. Yeah. But rehearsal space of all kinds. Yeah. Woods Hill Table. I mean, this is not necessarily a hotbed of rap music and hip-hop. Not yet. We're working on that. <laughs> We're working on it. West Concord. But you haven't heard of West Concord hip-hop? Yeah, exactly. I'm, <laughs> thinking about a, a bit that Steve Sweeney does. Oh, and a Steve uh, Sweeney, yeah. Yeah, he does a rap about, you know, I got my back against the wall at the Chestnut Hill Mall. I mean, you know, it's hysterical. <laughs> He's just so funny. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, we got to start with the city and try to find places where people can come together. And we've got, obviously, some of the best musical institutions from, you know, Berkeley to all the conservatories and all of that. I wanted to ask you, I know you have to leave here at four, so, but I wanted to ask yes. you, I know you, three times, you were diagnosed with, with cancer. With, with cancer. Yes. And I'm a very healthy person. That's fantastic. Otherwise. I mean, really and truly. That's fantastic. And we've all had friends and family who, who have had it's it. I've epidemic. had friends and family. Yes. You were just starting off your career, right, in TV when you were first diagnosed, is that correct? Yeah, I was uh, 26 years old, and I was about to get married in about a week. Not not only did it happen then, then it happened again. Yeah, 10 years later. Uh, So I had malignant melanoma, which is the most aggressive, vicious, deadly form of skin cancer, and it's still an incurable, but they're working on immunotherapy on that. And other things, I guess there's a vaccine or something, you know, so you probably know more about that. Well, not specifically, but I, I know as much, probably as much as you do now. Yeah. I mean, it's really hot right now. Yeah, the melanoma. Im, Im, immunology of cancer and how we can prevent it. Immunology, and then there was angiogenesis, which is Judah Folkman's thing. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Judah was also in my living room. I'm very involved in cancer and cancer yeah. research and trying to raise awareness about that. And then there's uh, all the gene therapy that they're doing and all the targeted therapies yeah. and Incredible. But this cancer has so many arms to it, and, oh. and one of the things is that I've I've seen that you've been involved in is the Hope Lodge, yes, which is an incredible place for people to come from all over the world right. to stay for free for free while they have with their, their families. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you brought that, that up. Actually. People give money for others to stay for the, that's a huge expense. Well, it, they don't have to put money into their own hotels. Can and, you imagine getting a diagnosis of cancer, finding out that the only life-saving treatment that you could get was, you know, a thousand miles away, and that if you didn't get it, you were going to die, and that the only way you could do that would be if you could figure out how to stay somewhere for six weeks or eight weeks, and you didn't know anybody there, and you were going to have to stay in a hotel for that time, you wouldn't be able to afford it. So you're trying to make a decision between, can I spend this money or shall I die? Do I give up? Do I? What do I do? So Hope Lodge provides free lodging for cancer patients and their families. It's bad enough to have that diagnosis, let alone being There's unable so many to worries access. On the shoulders, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just yeah. incredible. So right now, they're in the middle of trying to utilize the space that they have a little bit better. So when we first cut the ribbon on Hope Lodge, which is the only Hope Lodge in Boston. There's only one, and I wish there were, you know, five. They're trying to reutilize that space, expand it a little bit, and so we're trying to raise money for an expansion. But it's within a certain envelope that's already there, and that's as much as we're willing to take on right now. We just had a little fundraiser at the house and tried to get people reanimated to pursue this, but they're right in the middle of trying to do that. So it's a fabulous thing. It's like a Ronald McDonald house. It is. But yeah. people know Ronald McDonald house. They don't know Hope Lodge. Right. Right. And so how do we that. get the word out if we help out? Well, on the this podcast? is one good way. So thank you. Yeah, but how do we? Um, what's the? Is there a website? Is there something? Amer- it's the American Cancer Society. It's the AstraZeneca Hope Lodge in Boston. Okay. So you would just go to the ACS and look. Just look for anything on Hope Lodge. Ten years after the melanoma, I had ovarian cancer, and right. then I had ovarian cancer again. And uh, It recurred. It recurred, and yeah. the doctors were thinking this is a, another very difficult cancer because it's always diagnosed late. And for some reason, I had symptoms even though it was at a very early stage. Right. And I was misdiagnosed every single time. Yeah. So it's really kind of a miracle. You know, the doctors almost killed me, and then they saved my life. <laughs> so. Well, the good thing is that you always <laughs> yes. questioned 
and always. You, and you all, you even got second opinions. This too. is my big, my big thing. You have to take your own life in your hands. You have to be willing to confront people or challenge. You know, confront is the wrong word. You need to challenge what doctors tell you. Yeah, because it's a moving target. It's a moving and, target. It's tough the, to diagnose. There's going to be mistakes. You live but. inside your body, so you know it better than anybody else. So your job is to try to convey as much as you can. And it's a doctor's job to not just stay within the statistical norms and kind of look at you like a statistic. Because nobody is a statistic. Everybody is highly unique. And I fell outside of statistical norms every single time. And if I didn't speak up, I would not be here right now. And you were also talking about, you know, men especially too, because they'll they won't go to the doctor. Men typically. don't even go to right? the doctor. Right. So there's women that, will go, but they're afraid to question. There's that great billboard where it says, you know, thousands of men will die from stubbornness. And then someone spray painted on it. No, I won't. Uh, a, that's funny. <laughs> which is, I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah, it's, it's but, exactly right. So the reason so, I, the reason I brought yes. this up is because you being first of all, you're you're a pianist. Right? Yes, I pl- I play the piano. You play the piano. Yes. And you know, so at the time you were starting your career, you were the you were the arts reporter. Right. I watched you every night growing up when the evening local news was the news to watch. That's yes. you, right. That was. <laughs> you're three, the one, Chuck. No, I'm yeah. not the I'm not the only one. That was what we did. That's what you did. At six o'clock, you would right. sit and watch the news. Unfortunately. Why you just DVR it. <laughs> Very funny. Yeah. But, I, but I wonder at the, if at the time, if the arts and your musicianship and going to see theater, did that help you through the process? I mean, you were just beginning your career, so maybe yeah. it wasn't quite as a therapeutic no, thing I mean, for you. No, I mean, that's almost or? one step removed. It wasn't like the arts helped me. You know what helped me? Yeah. Finding out that there was a tremendous font of love and support out there that I didn't even realize was available. How good people were and are. It actually chokes me up to this day. I still meet people because I was very open about my disease. I didn't see any percentage in hiding it. I was going to be ill. I was going to be ill while I was on TV. There was a good chance I was going to lose my hair. I actually didn't. It just got kind of ratty looking. But uh, Mm -hmm. somebody said, oh, did you see that horrible wig Joyce Kalewick had on? And I'm thinking, that's no horrible wig. That's my (laughs) hair. And and it was growing all the way down my back because I didn't want to cut it. And the doctors were wrong about that. They said I was going to lose it. But I didn't lose it. But what was amazing was um, I didn't want to put any energy into hiding. I just wanted it to be known. I was ready to take anything anybody wanted to send my way. I needed all the love, help, and support I could get. And people... Yeah. just wrote me letters, cards. I still have things people sent me. I had restaurants send me food. I have dishes that they sent me. I have flower arrangements with like birds on them that I keep in my house. I meet people now, you know, who might be 50, 60, 70 years old and they say, oh, I remember when you were sick, Joyce. Are you okay? And I prayed for you. And yeah. it just gets me every time. Well, you were fabric of our lives. You, you it was and incredible. Liz, and they helped every, me. We saw you every day. Yeah. Every day. And you told us what to go do and see and... And what not to see. And what, and not, what not to, to see. see. And so when people would come up to me and they say, oh, do you mind if I'm saying hello or that I'm recognizing yeah. you? I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah, that's this fantastic. This is so great. It I mean, great. it's the reason I had my job. Yeah. The audience. We always have to remember the audience. So I, you respond to every card. Every call, every email. I spend hours now with people emailing me. You know, there's a fabric, there's a community, and people are just people. And that's true of Yo Yo, that's true of Meryl Streep, and I've talked to them all. <laughs> We're all the same. Everybody wants to be loved and accepted. And we need to plug into that and believe that. That's beautifully said. There has to be people that you've responded to or that you've had an impact with, with the thousands of ears out there that have, or have seen you or the eyes and ears mm-hmm. through that ordeal that were saved, in a sense, because of their trips to the doctor oh, yeah. and their just awareness of breast cancer, Oh, every time I speak, cancer, every time I, I'm out know. there, I tell people these stories and I tell them my story and then they'll come up to me and say, so-and-so heard your talk went and got diagnosed and she found her ovarian cancer early that must be I it's mean, just amazing it's what i'm here for you know i'm yeah. thinking i don't know why i'm here exactly you know maybe this is all artsy fartsy but there was no cancer in my family that should be the name of your uh, show by the way <laughs> what? artsy fartsy, artsy, fartsy. <laughs> but yeah I, and There's i think a reason, that I my think, yeah. my job was to get the disease 
get over it, tell people about it. And then you take in as much love as you need to make you well, and then you pass that on when you're well, give it to somebody else, you know? So there's this big, wonderful momentum that goes on. I tell people who are sick, let people help you. Let people love you. Be receptive if you can. I mean, everybody does this differently. Not everybody's going to be that open. Don't force anything. But allow yourself to be embraced by folks and then be well. Mm. And then you know you'll have a chance to give that back. My wife actually is, um, she's in medicine and she work, actually works with mindfulness for oncology patients. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if that's come up in some of your conversations about not just music and the arts, but that meditation space, mindfulness for wellness. Mindfulness, absolutely. And there's many ways to be mindful. Yoga is mindfulness. It's a meditation meditation in motion. The second time I had cancer, I actually figured out that I was not well right after a yoga workout. And I'm not any kind of, you know, I mean, I work out, you know, once every five years. It's really kind of ridiculous. <laughs> you look great. It's, whatever you're doing, it's working. I'm thin. That's our That's plan it. too. That's it. Thin yeah, every five years. and flabby. There it is. <laughs> My dad was very thin. So I, you know, I lucked out in the uh, metabolism department. But no, I don't work out. But I happen to do this yoga workout. And actually, I don't like exercise very much. But I do like yoga because it engages the body and the spirit and the mind. That's why I love the arts, because it engages all of me somehow. Even sitting in that seat. Hey, you and Sting. I feel... (laughs) Yoga and music. (laughs) Absolutely. You talked to Sting once, right? Very briefly. Okay, sorry. I really like him. I'd like to get to know him better. I'm trying to remember yeah. where I was well, going sorry. with that. But, I, I um, just derailed it. Oh, the but, yoga. Uh, so, the, yeah, the yeah. yoga workout. And right after I finished this yoga workout, I felt really cold. And I had chills. And I thought, oh, I forgot to put the thermostat up. And I looked, and the thermostat was up. And I realized I was cold. Yeah. And within minutes, I started being racked with pain. And I had a fever and chills. And I felt horrible all at once. And I think to this day, the yoga workout tuned me in in some way that mm. my body was making itself heard. And I got to uh, a hospital and they misdiagnosed me and sent me home <laughs> after about a week I insisted I wasn't well because I knew I wasn't well it's freaking doctors yeah it's right like, you know they'll oh. kill you and then they'll, then they'll save your life <laughs> so I love I, relationship. <laughs> oh I love doctors I'm very hard on them but we need to challenge them yeah, you know they're not yeah. gods I, they're humans I think we need to challenge podcast hosts we too. <laughs> we're challenged so so mindfulness yes we have to be tuned into our bodies and trust what they're telling us so that we can can tell our doctors and doctors need to know that there's information in there that they need to focus in and get at to help people not everybody is incredibly articulate some people don't like to talk some people are not tuned into their bodies particularly right. well so doctors can come up with a set of questions that will help guide it's like a guided meditation or mindfulness i think you're right to get at what's right there it's all there it's all here. Doctors need to see it. And the good ones, you know, medicine is an art and a science, as everything is, right? Oh, yeah. It's all connected. Well said. Well, I've only seen you maybe twice in person and many times on TV. And every time I see you, you have a big smile on your face. (laughs) So I'm that's got that's got to help. Person, I that's got to help. Yeah. I know. We're I gonna speak. see you on Saturday too. We'll see you on Saturday. Outrageous! Oh, you're gonna be there. We're oh, sp- fantastic! We're, we're sponsors. Is this a little bit too much As of well? us in one week? Yeah, it might yeah. Be. You know, I've had it. Already. <laughs> it might be. It might be. We'll keep. We'll keep. I'm like glad a you warned me because I'd be thinking, oh, they're gonna be stalking me. No, they're yeah. stalking <laughs> me. These two. <laughs> they're there again. There they are. Call the cops. Because I wandered into a gig, right? Didn't I wander? Yeah, but the Butler Frogs were playing. You walked in, and I was wearing my Bruins jersey, and I like just the dress code. Hey, work. I love that. You came in. A drink and you left. Yeah, we were trying to get into a restaurant. We thought, oh, let's pop over to the Main Street Cafe. Yeah, we're playing there Wednesday night. Very cool place. You sounded terrific. Oh, well, thank you very (laughs) much. You're just saying that. I know you are. No, no, no. You sounded terrific. Because I know you can be tough. I know you can be tough. Oh, yeah. That's right. You got to tell the truth. That's my currency. That's my currency. You can be tough. But thank you for sitting with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And you look fantastic. Thank you. And we're looking forward to seeing you on Saturday. Can't and, wait. Um, Artrageous. Is it Artrageous? Artrageous. Yes. Yes. It's going to be okay. at the uh, Neshoba Brooks instead of because they're redoing the whole building at Umbrella. Oh, right, right. Which is going to be fantastic so, when they So finish what are you it. wearing, Chuck? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I know, my clown shoes. You look shoes. great in the pink tool. Well, I, I yeah. look great in everything, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest with you. You should show your headshot on Facebook. I've got my headshot. And, yeah, and I'll show you my headshot. keep the baseball cap. No, I always keep the ba- Well, I'm a bald guy, so I need the baseball cap uh, for warmth. But thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank All you. Right. This has really been a pleasure. You made it very easy. Oh, we try. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. We try.
Read more about Joyce and check out her reviews and her thoughts about art, entertainment, and life at Joyce'sChoices.com. You can also find out more about the American Cancer Society's Hope Lodge and donate at Cancer.org and search for the Hope Lodge facility in your city. Go to AboveTheBasement.com where you can join us on Patreon, sign up for our newsletter, listen and subscribe to our podcast, like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, and look at all the nice pictures we post on Instagram. We are everywhere. On behalf of Ronnie and myself, thanks for listening. Tell your friends and remember Remember, Boston music, like its history, is unique. How would you like to join us in creating great conversations that inspire and connect? Patreon is a membership platform that provides a way for creators like us to build relationships and provide exclusive experiences to subscribers or patrons. We have been self-financed since we got off the ground in June of 2016, but in order to continue to fully invest all we can in each episode, we need your patronage. For more information, please go to patreon.com forward slash above the basement.